enough water? It is too much water. It is Californians battling to protect their homes from drought-filled wild wildfires. It is Midwest communities sandbagging levees to hold back the floodwaters. It is public health officials protecting the elderly from dangerous heat waves. It is water utilities trying to provide drinking water for a growing population. It is farmers trying to cope with not enough water or too much water. Certainly floods, droughts, and heat waves have always occurred. But by loading up the atmosphere with global warming pollution, we are loading up Mother, Nature, Mother Nature's dice for more extreme weather. As global warming pollution increases, we are rewriting the book on the planet's weather and climate. In the latest eye-opening reports from the United States Climate Change Science Program, scientists are predicting increases in heat waves, extreme rain and drought, and if we do nothing to change the course of these events, we may not like the way this story ends. Thankfully, this story is not finished. We can still choose how it ends. We must take action now to protect the most vulnerable amongst us from these extreme weather events. And there are solutions. Today we will hear, we will hear from a panel of experts who understand the extreme weather challenges our nation will face but are also actively working towards solutions to these challenges. Their testimony today will guide us towards a path of increasing our resilience to extreme weather. But we cannot simply treat the symptoms and fail to address the underlying sickness. As we increase our nation's resilience to extreme weather, we must also dramatically reduce our global warming pollution. Even with the best preparation, we have too many examples that point to our limited ability to cope with extreme weather. We need to look no further than the recurring annual death toll from heat waves or to the wildfires that burn millions of acres every year in the West or to the cities that struggle to provide water for their growing populations, uh, for their agriculture or for their hydroelectric power production. At the same time, extreme precipitation has caused the current devastation in the Midwest. Perhaps no weather disaster highlights our weakness to climate challenges than our inadequate response to Hurricane Katrina, which still haunts us several years later. Today we have several students in the room who have seen the devastation of extreme weather and our nation's failure to cope with this devastation firsthand. These participants in the Southeast Climate Witness Program were all displaced by Hurricane Katrina and are now studying the vulnerability of their regions to future storms and climate change. We thank them for their work and for coming to this hearing today. They illustrate that climate change is not just an environmental or economic issue, but it has impacts on real people and their communities. Global warming will push weather outside the range of what we used to know as normal. This also means that old methods of water protection will no longer be sufficient to meet the climate challenges for the future. We must protect society's most vulnerable people from the impacts we can no longer avoid while reducing global warming pollution to avoid a climate crisis. It is time for this Congress to write climate legislation that will ensure that the next chapter of our story is one that protects people and the planet. That completes the opening statement of the chair, and now we turn and recognize the ranking member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've heard the imperative of my distinguished chairman from Massachusetts that uh, we have to write this legislation. And as I recall reading his press releases and that of the majority party, that was supposed to be passed by July 4th of last year and we still don't have anything on the calendar. All that said, severe weather has imparted humanity since our earliest memories. Just ask Noah. Floods, droughts, hurricanes, tornadoes, and other natural disasters are something we humans have been learning to adapt to throughout time. Last month, I saw firsthand the effect of severe weather. Wisconsin was among the states hard hit by floods that wreaked havoc through much of the Midwest. 
30 Wisconsin counties were declared disaster areas, including all five in my district. The county of Waukesha suffered $90 million in damages, and many people were homeless because of the flooding. Wisconsin has seen many floods, and they often come with summer rains. For better or for worse, it's part of my state's natural meteorological uh, cycle. And while flood waters can't always be stopped, there are ways that people can adapt to these cycles and mitigate the damage and harm caused by them. Through technology, planning, and management, there are things we can do to adapt to weather extremes. And if the scientific forecasts are correct, we'll have to adapt. Projections show that no cut in greenhouse gases, no matter how steep, can stop some warming over the next decade. That's why I believe that adaptation should be a high priority in confronting climate change. While Wisconsin was recently overflowing in water, other parts of the country have precious little, and management of these resources will become more important if the temperature continues to rise. One of our witnesses today, Dan Keppen of the Family Farm Alliance, says farmers in the West are already preparing to adapt to a warmer climate. His testimony will also point out the need for a balance of both water conservation and supply enhancement a streamlined regulatory process that helps the development of new infrastructure and a prioritization of research needs. I agree and welcome him and all of the witnesses here today. In discussing priorities, Mr. Keppen pointed out that in California, some have projected it will take 2.5 trillion gallons or 2,500 billion gallons of water to produce that state's goal of a billion gallons of ethanol. Here is another reason to oppose this wasteful fuel subsidy and the mandates which were quadrupled in last year's energy bill. These mandates and subsidies are already driving up the cost of food and doing nothing to drive down the cost of gasoline. This is a waste of water and we are going to be preparing or paying for uh, this micromanagement of this part of our economy for years to come if we don't wake up and see the problems that it causes. Adapting to climate change in severe weather will require balance, coordination, and prioritization. Through these methods, we can sometimes help prevent or often worsen the sting of these weather events. But sometimes there's nothing we can do but to prepare, and sometimes even that's not enough, as the people of my state learned that last month. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Just uh, a couple comments. Uh, you know, I come from Washington State. We got a little rain up in Washington State, and people don't think Washington State is sort of an epicenter of you know extreme events. We don't have many tornadoes or hurricanes, but last year we had a rain event that uh, for the first time in 135 years closed Mount Rainier National Park and literally destroyed a lot of the places I'd grown up with, really, really beautiful places. I went hiking at a place called Sourdough Mountain last summer, and right in the middle coming down this mountain is this huge gash about 60 feet deep. It looks like somebody took a giant knife and just cut a big gash down this mountain where this little teeny tiny creek had absolutely gone insane in this incredible rain event. And that kind of rain event is, is completely consistent with more frequent rain events of, of more intense duration that we expect to see in the future. No one can say specifically that that rain event was associated with global warming. The science does not allow that. But it's something we expect. And the reason I mention that is when people talk about these events, that mountain, Sourdough Mountain, had been there for a long, long time. There weren't gashes like that on that mountain at least during my lifetime. And I, I just mention it because this is something that hits places even with mild weather, like the state of Washington, which has the mildest, dampest, grayest environment in the country. The second thing I want to say is that when we think of extreme weather events, we're thinking of extreme in the human sense, but there's extreme weather events that can cause enormous differences in the world that, that are just you know, like a half a degree the very small changes of just a few degrees in the Arctic are totally changing the entire ecosystem of the Arctic. The Arctic ice cap is predicted to be gone in total by late summer within the next several decades, and there is some indication that this year could see an 80 percent or plus reduction of the Arctic summer ice cap this year, and there was a 70 or 80 percent reduction last year, which shocked the scientific community. 
point I want to make is, is that relatively small, we wouldn't think of a three or four degrees Fahrenheit change as an extreme weather event. But in the context of changing whole ecosystems, that's extreme. And I think we've got some work to do. Thanks. Gentlemen, time has expired. We recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I'd like to begin by welcoming, welcoming Dr. Jay Golden of my home state of Arizona to the committee. Dr. Golden is working on a number of exciting projects at Arizona State University uh, dealing with innovative renewable energy generating technologies and energy reducing materials and surface treatments, among other things. Uh, I look for forward to the testimony of Dr. Golden as well as to that of the other members. Examining the effects of a warming climate, regardless of what is ultimately determined to be the cause uh, of that warming, is important to our country and very important to my state of Arizona and to my city of Phoenix, uh, which sits in a very warm portion of the nation and is affected and I think is a great example of a heat island. Uh, it, I think it is critically important for us at both the local, state and national level to identify how uh, these events are brought about and how to handle the impacts of these weather-related phenomena. As a young boy growing up in Arizona, I can remember uh, the summer weather, which would always bring storms to the valley from the southeast. Uh, these were called the, it was called the monsoon season, and they would bring these huge dust storms north. And in those days, the storms would move all the way through uh, the city of Phoenix and pass on uh, to the northwest. This is the exact opposite of the weather pattern we have in the wintertime when our storms come from the northwest and move to the southeast. Uh, interestingly, over my lifetime, as Phoenix has become a much bigger and bigger city uh, with uh, miles and miles, square miles after square mile of concrete and asphalt and uh, tall uh, concrete and glass buildings, I believe we have seen a tremendous impact of what I would call the heat island effect. And now uh, almost none of those storms make, it, make their way all the way through the valley uh, and uh, emerge on the other side. They tend to, to hit the valley and go out around it. Uh, I am personally fascinated in how much modern building materials affect that urban, that urban uh, environment uh, and can affect these issues. And I think it's very important for us to know uh, how to adapt various building materials to accommodate that, maybe not to have the heat island effect be as extreme, and also various insulating materials. We all know that uh, for a long time in this country, landlords would build large commercial buildings without properly insulating them or thinking about their energy footprint. Uh, recognizing they were going to pass on the bill for the operation of that building to somebody else. So I think this is important, and while we cannot play God and control the weather, we can certainly adapt to it, as we have for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, we need to focus our efforts on using our available resources uh, as efficiently and as effectively as possible. And for that reason, Mr. Chairman, uh, I thank you for those holding, holding this hearing, and I hold, yield back my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. Uh, communities across California, as you know, are really feeling the climate change. In fact, right now, we're experiencing well over 1,700 uh, fires that have uh, been caused in California, either by lighting or by uh, human activity. Uh, what we need to look at, I believe, is that uh, we, as humans, have created a lot of our own problems, and we, as humans, have to then create solutions to those problems. So I'm hoping that we'll hear from our witnesses today that they can help us address this issue. I'm very concerned because even in a community like Long Beach, which is not too far away from where I live, they're expecting to see that uh, there will be a big dip in their water, uh, water tables there, providing uh, millions, uh, millions of uh, water for for individuals, but that is slowly dipping to th almost 30 percent. So these are dramatic events that are taking place in Southern California. Last year at this time we had severe fires, firestorms. We're not even in that period right now in California where the Santa Ana winds are whipping up. That's going to happen later on after August and September. And we know that we are, uh, we are really overutilizing our resources and we have to attend to these uh, very, very important issues. So I yield back the balance of my time and look forward to hearing from our witnesses. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the uh, gentlelady, from, uh, <laughs> gentlelady from Tennessee who was here first. Uh, and thank you. I appreciate that as my colleague and I both uh, arrived about the, same, about the same time. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you uh, for the hearing and I want to welcome our witnesses um, and thank them for coming before us to talk about extreme weather and global warming and 
everyone agrees that extreme precipitation events are on the rise, but the question for many of us, is this a trend or is it just natural and a natural occurrence? And um, Mr. Chairman, I have two articles uh, that were published in Water Resources Research and in the Australian Meteorological Magazine that add, shed some light on the issue, and I've used them in my preparation for today, and I'd like to submit those to the record. Without objection, I'll be included. I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. These papers found that the intensity levels were high in some years and low in others, and a significant increase in the number of thunder days. But they concluded that there was nothing unusual about the recent trends, and I'll look forward to hearing from you all on these. The trends could not be attributed to global warming, and most increases weren't due to climate change. Instead, the changes actually stem from new observational practices that caused artificial trends in climate data. And uh, we also have uh, some research on the tree ring uh, from their international conference, and we're looking forward to covering that with you and hearing from you on uh, these issues again. We want to make certain that we have accurate data, that we have accurate models, and that we are making the appropriate decisions as we look at the issue. And I thank you all for your time and your preparation. I yield back. Great. The gentlelady's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Van Herney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this hearing is timely and it's important. Uh, I'm from Northern California, north of. Uh, my colleague uh, from Southern California, and we're experiencing drought, uh, heat, and excessive fires, massive fires. People that live in the district are breathing smoke uh, in 110 degree weather. So uh, there's a lot of concern about the future, what that means. This sort of uh, event is consistent with what I believe global warming will bring California, is uh, deserts claiming f uh, territory farther and farther north, on how is that going to manifest? It's going to manifest by fires and it's going to manifest by heat and, and drought. So uh, I'm concerned and I want to see that we take the right steps. And part of that is understanding exactly what uh, the experts believe is in store for us uh, so that we can not only uh, prepare, we can mitigate, we can adapt, uh, and we can make the right decisions in a bipartisan way. So I look forward to your testimony. Thank you for coming today and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, holding this hearing. I want to uh, join in here in terms of what climate change may mean uh, for those of us from the West. And I think my colleagues from California spoke of the fires that uh, they're unfortunately experiencing. And uh, Oregon usually follows California in the fire wave of the of the season. And I think the two things that come to mind are: first of all, we know from uh, research data and testimony from the Forest Service that our forests are going to be really impacted. If it gets hotter and drier, more drought, as you all have talked about, um, then you're going to have more bug infestation, disease, and forest fires. And our forest fire officials have come to me, or forest, both firefighting officials and forest uh, supervisors, and said, give us the authority you gave us in the Healthy Forest Restoration Act, which has worked well around our wildland urban interfaces. Let us do that out in the condition class two and three lands that are most out of whack with balance of nature so we can get ahead of this a bit, get those forests thinned so that they can uh, be more adaptive to the change in climate and be able to resist the wildfire that we know will come because it will be thinned out. You won't have the latter fuels and therefore fire will act like it used to act uh, before we suppress fire. The second issue I think that, that we all in the West, especially the arid West, uh, need to be cognizant of, if it is going to be drier, then we need to look at how we manage water and especially how we store water. Because uh, if the snowpacks do recede, although this year we seem to have had an abundance of snow, which was nice, uh, especially for those of us who are skiers, um, but if we are going to see a reduction in snowpack, then we need to focus on how you do off-stream storage, how you do additional storage of water, and how we allocate that in an appropriate way, how we you know, uh, best manage our water. We're going to get some great testimony, I think, today from Dan Keppen, who I'll introduce later on this topic and on others. So I think there are things that Congress could do to change the law that would help on water management, storage, and forest health and survivability of our forests, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and uh, reducing the threat of fire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair will now recognize the uh, gentleman from Arizona for the purposes of introducing our first speaker. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are very pleased to have in the Maricopa County area in Phoenix, Arizona, Arizona State University, a, a recognized excellent center uh, in higher education. And uh, I have relied on them many times this year for expertise and advice on issues confronting the Congress. I am pleased to welcome, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, Dr. J.S. Golden. Uh, Dr. Golden has a wide background, uh, not just from academia. He served as an environmental crimes detective. He served as regional operations vice president for a Fortune, Fortune 500 company. He established his own multi-state environmental en engineering firm and then uh, returned and received his Ph.D. in engineering from the University of Cambridge uh, and a master's degree in environmental en engineering and sustainable development from the Cambridge MIT Institute. He currently serves as an assistant professor in the School of Sustainability and an affiliate of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Arizona State University. He founded and serves as the director of the National Center of Excellence on Smart Innovations for Urban Climate and Energy. His research is focused on the climate energy nexus, including quantifying and developing mitigation strategies that address the resulting environmental, human health, energy, and economic impacts. Uh, he was appointed to the United Nations Life Cycle Management Task Force, and finally, he directs the Sustainability Energy Fellowship, uh, which educates some of our most exceptional students uh, in environmental and energy and sustainability issues. Uh, Dr. Golden, we welcome you to uh, here to the committee. start again. Thank you. Congressman Shattuck, I thank you for that introduction. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Sensenbrenner, and other members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to address you on these important issues. The National Center, which I direct, supports local and regional agencies to develop strategies to reduce vulnerability and risk associated with extreme weather events. We focus on heat waves, the urban heat island effect, and the relationship to reliable electricity delivery. First, allow me to present some driving factors behind our research and why I believe greater federal action needs to be taken to support state, regional, and local governments as they seek to protect their national security. Factor number one is more people in the United States die from heat-related events than all other weather-related phenomenon combined. That is, more Americans die each year from extreme heat from, than from lightning, hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods combined. Factor number two, global climate change which will increase human health vulnerability as more frequent and extreme weather events, including heat waves, impact our country. In their 2008 report, the U.S. Climate Change Science Program concluded that abnormally hot days and nights and heat waves are very likely to become more frequent. Additionally, since the record hot year of 1998, six of the last 10 years have had annual average temperatures that fall in the hottest 10 percent of all years recorded in history for the U.S. Factor number three is the urban heat island effect. Over half of our planet's population now lives in cities, of 30 percent from 50 years ago. But in 2000, more than 8 out of 10 Americans lived in metropolitan areas. With increased population comes rapid change in our land cover and an increased use of engineered materials for our buildings. These retain our heat in our cities, contributing to the urban heat island effect. As an example, the urban heat island effect, the average annual temperatures in the combined urban rural area of Phoenix, Arizona, have increased 3.1 degrees Fahrenheit during the 20th century. However, mean annual temperatures in just the urban portions of our region have increased 7.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Factor four, a vulnerable electrical system. In the U.S., parts of our electrical delivery capability are at increasing risk of failure. Urban heat islands and heat waves are almost certain to cause increased demand. By 2025, U.S. electricity consumption is projected to grow by 50 percent over 2003 levels. To meet this rising demand, an equivalent to almost 950 new power plants of 300 megawatts each will be needed. The primary means of adaptation to climate change is mechanical cooling, air conditioning. The greater demand, the more fragile our system becomes as older units fail due to mechanical breakdowns and as heavily laden power lines stretch and sag from heat. My recommendations. Action number one, develop a stronger and more integrated urban research focus because no one mission agency in the federal government has responsibility for all the components of a city. No government body is funding research that looks at how all the parts fit together. Who will synthesize all this information to a model or models that incorporate as much data as possible? Fundamentally, Congress should direct agencies and the NRC to look for ways to create synergistic urban research programs. Number two, a dedicated urban satellite system, remote sensing from space can and needs to play a vital role in protecting human health and the environment from climate change, urban heat islands, and failures of electrical power systems. 
Scientists continue to develop and refine very complex predictive models to gain a greater understanding of urban and global climate change. However, the current dedicated satellite system that provide the basis for our ability to prevent human harmful impacts is in jeopardy of phase out and abandonment and or failure. Action item number three, streamline and enhance electricity interruption reporting requirements. We lack an effective and consistent national level program that examines the interactions of the built environment, climate and safe electricity de delivery for our cities, let alone an effective way to track outages. At best, our current system can be considered confusing and less than adequate. We need to increase our understanding of electricity outages of different scales. In short, we need a new comprehensive and rational power outage reporting system. Finally, I strongly urge this committee and Congress to support the development of a report to all appropriate committees of Congress on the issues of heat waves, urban heat islands, and human health vulnerability. A proactive effort will provide Congress greater insights and multi-staker recommendations on three primary topics. Identify existing and emerging needs of local and regional governments to prepare and respond to human health vulnerability resulting from heat waves, urban heat on effect, climate change, and power outages. Number two, examine the roles and capabilities of federal agencies to support local and regional governments and suggest programs to improve these capabilities. Finally, provide recommendations for future research initiatives that can reduce vulnerability and improve our national security. I strongly caution that the timing of such an effort must be immediate by waiting and not addressing these issues in the present day we risk our population and our national security today and into the future. Thank you. Thank you for that courtesy, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I want to welcome Dan Keppen, who is uh, a good friend and one of the West's finest advocates for family farmers and ranchers. He's a fellow Oregonian. Uh, Dan resides in Klamath County, which is in the southern part of uh, the district I have the honor of representing. And Dan has, for the last three years, served as the executive director of the Family Farm Alliance, which is a grassroots farmer advocacy group that aims to ensure the availability of reliable and affordable water for irrigation in the West. Before joining the Family Farm Alliance in 2005, Dan served three years as the executive director of the Klamath Water Users Association, where I worked closely with him on one of the, the West's most prominent and challenging water management issues, uh, the Klamath Reclamation Project. And if anyone can speak with authority about the importance of water in the West for farms and families and communities, it's Dan Keppen. After all, few people were more involved in helping find solutions in the 2001 water cutoff in the Klamath Basin than Dan. He's a real expert on water and farm issues, knows full well the impacts that a change in the weather can have on those who make their living from the land. From 2000 to 2001, Dan served as a special assistant to the Bureau of Reclamation's Mid-Pacific Regional Director in Sacramento, where he advised and assisted with planning, managing, directing, and coordinating a variety of Reclamation's water management activities. He received his Master's of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Oregon State University and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Wyoming. It's my pleasure to welcome before the committee uh, Dan Keppen, and I look forward to his testimony and, and that of the other witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wallen and uh, Chairman Markey, members of the Select Committee. Appreciate this opportunity to uh, testify today. Again, my name is Dan Keppen. I'm the Executive Director of the Family Farm Alliance, uh, World Headquarters in Klamath Falls, Oregon. We represent irrigators in all 17 Western states. Um, we are also committed to the, the fundamental proposition that Western irrigated agriculture must be preserved and protected for a host of reasons, uh, many of which are often overlooked in the context of other policy decisions. The topic of this oversight hearing is not only important to the Alliance, it is also relevant to water users, farmers, ranchers, and small communities all over the Western United States. My board of directors in 2007 made climate change a priority issue for our organization to engage in. And last year we released a report entitled uh, Water Supply in a Changing Climate, the Perspective of Family Farmers and Ranchers in the Irrigated West. Uh, I'd like to respectfully submit this to be included in the, uh, the hearing record today. Thank you. Our uh, report shows that uh, climate change could further strain fresh water supplies in the American West. It provides several examples of studies that focus on specific regions or watersheds in the West, and they indicate that for the most part, from the Colorado River Basin to the Pacific Northwest to the Central Valley of California, climate change has and will continue to impact water supplies and the users dependent on those supplies in the future. 
The Western Governors Association has developed findings that are consistent with our examples of climate impacts to water supplies across the West as reported in our document. In general, Western Governors predicts four general predictions. Smaller snowpacks and earlier snow melt, more rain than snow, extreme flood events, which could be more common and become larger, and droughts and higher temperatures, which could be more intense, frequent, and last longer, which will obviously have an impact on, on irrigators. In some areas, western water supplies are already challenged by the demands of agriculture, urban growth, and environmental enhancement. Global climate change, we're told, will further reduce those supplies. So how will we meet the ever-increasing demand for water in the West in an era when there will be an ever-decreasing supply? We recommend an adaptive approach as well uh, to dealing with the uncertainties of climate change. Even if current efforts to mitigate for greenhouse gas emissions are successful, the climate is still predicted to warm considerably over the next several decades, which will have impacts on water supplies and water users. Improved conservation and efficiency by urban and agricultural water users is certainly part of the solution, but only one part. We must begin to implement a balanced suite of both conservation and supply enhancement actions. Conservation alone will not supply enough water for the tens of millions of existing and new residents expected to live in western cities during the coming decades. We believe that it's possible to meet the needs of cities and the environment in a changing climate without sacrificing western irrigated agriculture. It's time to start developing and implementing the water infrastructure needed to cope with a changing climate, meet the needs of a growing population, protect our environment, and support a healthy agricultural base in the West. We need to streamline the often slow and cumbersome federal regulatory process to, to improve, modernize, and expand our water infrastructure. And finally, we must prioritize our research needs to accomplish useful studies that inform water managers and their users of key actions that must be accomplished to deal with a changing climate. My boss, president of the board for the Alliance, is Patrick O'Toole, a, a rancher from Wyoming. He testified before the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee last year on, on S-2156, the Secure Water Act, sponsored by Senators Bingaman and Domenici. This bill includes water science initiatives, water efficiency programs, and additional actions that will help us adapt to the water-related impacts of global climate change. These provisions closely match sim similar recommendations made in the report that we developed. While there is not currently a companion bill introduced in the House, we would encourage the House to take up a similar bill to help speed its enactment into law. We believe change of climate will further strain fresh water supplies in the American West. We must begin to plan for that now and not wait until we are forced to make decisions during a crisis. Now is the time to enact sound policies that encourage continued investment in irrigated agriculture. Reallocating farmers' water supplies will diminish domestic food production at exactly the same time global warming is predicted to severely adverse impact, uh, adversely impact food production worldwide. Relying on agriculture to be a shock absorber, to soften or eliminate the impending water shortage is not planning. It's an easy fix that carries with it enormous consequences to our society and our nation. While much of the debate surrounding what to do about climate change is centered on mitigation for greenhouse gas emissions, we believe that climate change policies for irrigated agriculture in the future need to address adaptive approaches that prepare for the worst case scenarios predicted for western watersheds. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before the committee again, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Our next witness is Heather Cooley. Heather Cooley is a senior research associate with the Pacific Institute Water and Sustainability Program. At the Institute, her research involves water privatization, California water issues and environmental justice, and climate change. Prior to the Institute, she worked at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, where she studied climate and land use change in carbon cycling. She has published a book on freshwater resources, ranging on issues from floods and droughts to impacts on businesses and ecosystems, and has testified before the State of California regarding management of freshwater resources. She holds a a Bachelor of Science in Molecular Environmental Biology with an emphasis in ecology from UC Berkeley and an MS in Energy and Resources from UC Berkeley. Welcome and thank you for coming, Ms. Cooley. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to offer testimony on the growing risks to the nation from extreme weather events as a result of climatic change. I will limit my discussion here to floods and, and droughts and how we can adapt to these changes 
but my written testimony expands on a broader range of risks and responses. Floods and droughts have dominated the headlines in papers across the United States in recent months. Floods along the Mississippi rivers and its tributaries have devastated communities throughout the Midwest. Drought conditions are prevailing across large parts of the United States, and in California, drought conditions have spawned nearly 2,000 fires since late June in what may turn out to be one of the worst fire seasons on record. Yet most of the discussion about climate change has focused on average condi conditions, but the nation is far more vulnerable to extreme events like those we are experiencing throughout the country today. These extreme events have the largest social, economic, and environmental impacts. They kill and injure the most people, and they cause the most damage to our economy and environment. Scientists are increasingly investigating the risks of e these extreme events, and in short, they conclude we are loading the dice in favor of an increase in severe events, and the nation's water resources appear to be most at risk. In particular, research now shows that warmer, tens warmer temperatures will intensify the hydrologic cycle, leading to greater climate variability and, unfortunately, an increase in the risk of both floods and droughts. The idea that both floods and droughts may increase may seem counterintuitive to some, but let me provide an example that is particularly relevant to the West to illustrate this point. In the West, snowfall and snowmelt are critical for water supply. The research indicates that warmer temperatures will raise the snow line in mountainous regions, causing more precipitation to fall as rain rather than snow, and thereby increasing the likelihood of winter floods. To make matters worse, these higher temperatures will lead to an earlier and faster snowmelt, increasing the likelihood of droughts and water shortages during the summer months when our farms and cities need water the most. But what can we do about these growing risks? Impacts associated with climate change are now unavoidable, but that doesn't mean we are helpless. Let me touch on a few options that my written testimony describes in much greater detail. First, smarter floodplain management. In the past, we've relied heavily on levees for flood protection, but these measures can often give a false sense of security, encouraging development and putting more lives and people at risk. The 1994 Galloway Report from General Galloway and the Army Corps of Engineers strongly called for a new approach, one based on, and I quote, avoiding the risks of the floodplain, minimizing the impact of these risks when they cannot be avoided, mitigating the impacts of damages when they occur, and accomplishing the above in a manner that concurrently protects and enhances the natural environment. Second, we must develop new alternative supplies. Recycled water, for example, can be used in a w for a wide range of purposes, from agricultural and landscape irrigation to power plant cooling and groundwater recharge. Agencies throughout the West are beginning to pursue recycled water, but we need to encourage this transition. In addition, better groundwater management would allow us to store excess surface water, including storm water, in groundwater aquifers during wet years for later use in dry years. In the past, we often looked at stormwater as a liability and sought to get it out of our cities as quickly as possible. But now communities are realizing that this is an asset, that we can then recharge our groundwater and use it again when we need it. And finally, water conservation and efficiency offers enormous potential for reducing water, water pressures on water supply and must be central to any effort to adapt to climate change. We have made some remarkable achievements in the past 20, 25 years and as the figures on page 11 of my written testimony indicate, total water use in the nation has actually declined despite continued economic and population growth. But much more potential to improve the efficiency of water use remains. Work we have done at the Pacific Institute indicates that the urban sector could reduce its water use by a third at lower cost than new supply. And that's in California where we've already done quite a bit, but there's still a tremendous amount available. There's also potential for the agricultural sector. These efficiency improvements can also help us reduce the impacts of climate change. Capturing, treating, transporting, and using water require large amounts of energy. In California alone, an estimated 19% of the electricity use 
32 percent of the natural gas and 88 million gallons of diesel fuel consumption are water related. Thus, conservation and efficiency improvements can also save energy, thereby reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Furthermore, a recent analysis from the California Energy <coughs> Commission found that energy can be saved through water conservation at lower cost than through traditional energy efficiency measures. In closing, I would like to urge members of the committee to take action now. Waiting another five to 10 years will only make solving these problems more difficult and costly. Furthermore, all of the options I discussed, smarter floodplain management, better groundwater management, recycled water, and conservation make sense under today's climate conditions and can help reduce current pressures on our water system. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our next witness is from my home state, Ms. Angela Licata, who serves as Deputy Commissioner for the New York City Department of Environmental Protection and Director of the Bureau of Environmental Planning and Analysis. She has worked in uh, NYCDP for over 20 years. As Deputy Commissioner, she oversees climate change issues for the agency, the development of a watershed and sewer shed program for Jamaica Bay, stormwater management planning, natural resource planning, and sewer infrastructure planning as it relates to new growth simulated by rezoning throughout the city. She is also an expert in environmental planning assessment and negotiates complex land use and permitting issues. Uh, Ms. Licata, you are now recognized. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I am Angela Licata, Deputy Commissioner with New York City's Department of Environmental Protection. On behalf of Commissioner Emily Lloyd, thank you for the opportunity to speak before your committee today. Climate change certainly raises serious challenges to the future of New York City's water supply, delivery, stormwater management, and wastewater treatment systems. In 2007, Mayor Michael Bloomberg released Plan YC. This is a comprehensive, sustainable urban plan for New York City that includes 127 initiatives to create a greener, more sustainable city. One of the key challenges addressed by Plan YC is global climate change. In May of 2008, DEP released the first report of its climate change assessment and action plan, detailing the extensive work that DEP has undertaken to better understand and plan for the potential impacts of climate change on the city's water and sewer systems. I am submitting the report to the committee for its consideration. The report outlines specific steps that DEP is taking to, one, refine climate change projections for the city of New York. Two, better quantify risks to existing systems. Three, integrate climate change data into current design for new projects. Four, develop adaptation strategies for critical infrastructure. Adequate funding for ongoing research in the short term and for capital investments in infrastructure upgrades in the long term is crucial to our ability to adapt to a changing climate. Customized climate change projections performed for DEP by Columbia University's Center for Climate Systems Research and NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies indicates that by 2050, New York City and its watershed region will experience a 3 to 5 degree Fahrenheit rise in temperature, a 2.5 to 7.5 percent increase in precipitation, and a 6 to 12 inch rise in sea level. It is projected that these conditions will be even more pronounced by the year 2080. Without proper planning and extensive adaptations, this degree of climate change could have a significant effect on the city's drinking water quality and supply. Preliminary analysis indicates that rising temperatures could extend the growing season, exaggerate the frequency and severity of droughts, and heat waves will likely change the ecology of our watershed. Rising temperatures coupled with heavier precipitation could wash additional nutrients and particles into water supply reservoirs, thereby increasing turbidity and eutrophication levels, thus compromising the viability of New York City's currently unfiltered drinking water system. Increased precipitation could also overwhelm stormwater drainage systems, wastewater treatment facilities, and sewer infrastructure. Rising seas coupled with storm surges pose a threat to our coastal wastewater treatment facilities. 
Recently, in fact, an observed increase in the frequency of severe rainfall events, which may be evidence of changing climate conditions, is alarming and unprecedented in the written record. In 2007, for example, on April 15, 17 inches of rain were recorded in Upper Manhattan, the largest daily accumulation since 1882. On July 18, 2007, between 3 and 5 inches of rain were recorded at locations across the city within a four-hour period. In some areas, 3 inches of rain fell in one hour. And on August 8, 2007, between 1.4 and 3.5 and inches of rain were recorded within a two-hour period. Our current stormwater conveyance system is designed only for 1.75 inches of rainfall per hour. Given that the rate of return from which larger storms has historically occurred very infrequently. Climate change is a complex emerging issue. The timing and extent of change are uncertain, and modifying large scale infrastructure systems is expensive and takes time. But with sufficient support, we can develop and implement strategies that will help ensure the long term viability of our drinking water and wastewater systems. Working in concert with Plan YC, Mayor Bloomberg's Comprehensive Urban Sustainability Initiative, DEP is already planning for the diversification of the New York City's drinking water supply by increasing the interconnectivity and flexibility of our systems. We are also developing aggressive conservation programs, increasing water supply protection measures through a robust land acquisition program within our watershed, and building new drinking water quality infrastructure. In another step forward, New York City DEP has also joined with water providers serving seven of the country's major metropol uh, metropolitan areas to form the Water Utility Climate Alliance. Working together, we aim to foster research aimed at advancing climate science and to develop more robust decision support frameworks. This alliance recognizes the importance of federal partnerships in this endeavor. DEP's 10-year capital program budget is intended to fund infrastructure investments on a 50-year time scale. Could you summarize, please? Mm -hmm. Integrating climate change projections within departmental planning will help ensure that the city's water and wastewater systems are more resilient and better prepared to withstand the volatile conditions of a changing climate. Once again, I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Cleaver will be recognized to uh, introduce our final witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's with great uh, pride and, and pleasure that I introduce Jimmy uh, Adegoki, who is an associate professor in uh, the Department of Geosciences at the Uni University of Missouri uh, in Kansas City, UMKC, uh, in uh, the city uh, where I reside. He uh, studied the role of land surfaces uh, uh, play in uh, driving weather and climate change, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Adegoki's research also looks at linkages and feedbacks between the processes that impact air quality and heat stress, heat stress in changing uh, urban environments. And as a member of the Geosciences Department, he was recently invited to serve on the advisory committee of remote sensing experts to assist the United Nations program in assessing various country level projects in ecosystem and water management in different uh, African countries. He has a BS. He has an MS in climatology. He has a PhD in satellite climatology from Penn, Penn State and was awarded the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Postdoctoral Fellowship in Regional Climate Modeling. Uh, we are very, very proud of him uh, in uh, Kansas City and pleased to have him uh, present to uh, this committee. That's great. Uh, welcome, sir. I would like to thank the chairman, to, to thank Chairman Mackey and the ranking member, uh, since Brenner, and all the members of the select committee for this opportunity to appear before you and address the energy and environmental challenges facing our nation, uh, climate variability and climate change, uh, in particular uh, focusing on the Midwest region. I'd like to thank uh, Congressman Emmanuel Cleaver, who is my representative, for his service on this important select committee and his guidance locally. The United States Midwest is uh, one of the most agriculturally, pr agriculturally productive areas or regions in the world. It supports a wide range of agro-businesses and industrial manufacturing complexes that are economical, economically vital to uh, the United States. This region 
is also susceptible to substantial interannual and interdecadal variations in summer climate, frequent severe droughts and devastating floods are features of the extreme warm season climate anomalies that affect much of the central U.S. The drought of 1988, for instance, the flood of 93, resulted in estimated $52 billion loss in, 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 farm, in, farm, in, in, in farm and property damage in the Midwest. The last two summers, 2007 and 2008, have been especially devastating for us, for large swaths of the Midwest, Due to, large, this, due to this back to back floods that have destroyed thousands of acres of prime farmland in several states and submerged whole communities. The losses sustained from just these two last flood events alone undoubtedly will run into tens of billions of dollars. The financial impact of the current flood is exacerbated by the fact that many property owners in the worst hit areas lack flood insurance because they live in areas deemed 500-year flood plains, where mortgage banks, banks do not require flood insurance. Furthermore, it's been reported that many communities in, in Wisconsin, in Iowa, and Missouri either dropped out of the, or, or never even participated in the federally funded, not five minutes yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in the federally funded, um, flood insurance program for, that, for, that, for, for the same reason. This makes residents in these communities ineligible for federal aid under the existing rules uh, for the national flood insurance program. So against this backdrop, the decision of the chairman, um, this committee, to, to hold this hearing is both timely and highly commendable. My written testimony, which, is, which, 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 which has been submitted um, for the record, contains an overview of the evidence that supports the view, the scientific evidence that supports the view that we are indeed in a regime of enhanced climate variability. We're already there. We're not looking, we're not looking for, um, for, 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 ch for a changing climate anymore. We're in a regime of enhanced climate variability. Um, I, that's, that testimony also discusses what are the implications of these current and the future changes that we expect um, on the Midwest using um, what I advocate as, as a vulnerability framework. And, and, I, and, and I also offer some thoughts and strategies for mitigating and managing those, those risks. Okay. Um, this committee has been addressed by several of my colleagues on this, on this, on this by, by my, my colleagues on this table on, on what the current state is and the fact that um, evidence has accumulated to show that the climate is changing and, and will continue to change. Now, um, the U.S., the trend in the U.S. Is, is, uh, follows exactly what, what we know from, from global assessments. And the trend in both temperature and precipitation in the Midwest in particular, they reflect these same national trends with some regional variations. For example, we know that the northern Midwest has warmed by almost four degrees Fahrenheit, while the, south, the southern Midwest, especially in the Ohio Valley re re region, has cooled by a little less than one degree Fahrenheit. Annual precipitation has increased by over 20 percent in some areas, with most of this um, most, most of this increase coming from periods of heavy rainfall. Okay, so this is the we know as our climate has already changed um, in the Midwest. Now the evidence available to us from climate model pro projections suggests that um, these trends will continue and will in fact accelerate in a warming world. Higher temperatures will increase the water holding capacity of the atmosphere and encourage greater evapor evaporation, resulting in conditions that favor increased climate variability and with more intense precipitation and more droughts. We can also expect, expect, expect increased frequency and severity of heat waves and greater potential for reduced air quality in our urban areas. Now, these projections, these projections are the, re that the, are the result Mr. Adic, of- Adic Oki, if you could just wrap up, please, and we'll okay. go to the questions. Now, these projections are the result of climate models. And um, our, our contention is that while these give us a sense um, to, uh, a direction to go forward, 
we need to begin to address these issues, as in particular from a vulnerability perspective. We are already vulnerable, and we need to think about how specific sectors can be strengthened and, 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 and new mitigation um, strategies developed to address our risks and, and vulnerabilities in these various sectors. Thank you, Dr. Adagoki. We very much appreciate it. There are four roll calls that are going to be um, conducted out on the House floor. There are 11 minutes to go before that roll call. What I thought I could do is recognize the gentleman from Washington State for a round of questions. And then if Mr. Um, Inslee would do that, recognize then Mr. Shattuck so that uh, we can have a bipartisan question. And then we'll come back and continue to question the panel. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kepton, uh, I used to live in Yakima, Washington, had a lot of experience with the irrigation community, and I think know the stresses that you're under. Has your group uh, taken a look at the issue of a cap and trade system to try to actually uh, limit the amount of warming that we experience and climatic change that we experience? Uh, you know, our, basically our, our mission statement is focused completely on, you know, water and, and water issues. And so as a board, we have not um, dealt with that. Personally, uh, I'm on Governor Kulingowski's Climate Change Integration Group in Oregon, and that's a, an issue that's being discussed there. I, I think agriculture definitely needs to be involved from a personal standpoint, but uh, as an organization, we haven't taken a position. Well, I would encourage you to, to think about that and become engaged in that discussion. And the reason I say that is that, you know, ag, I think, has probably got as much at risk as any other sector of our community. And knowing how fragile our irrigation system is in eastern Oregon, eastern Washington, how we're always on the edge, we will be pushed over by reductions in our snowpack and, and just dry years. We need your leadership and we need your, your engagement in this issue as a, as a community. So I, I hope that you will think, I hope that you, your organization will think not just about adaptation and accepting this change, but in fact trying to slow it down. And you know, there's a whole variety of ways to do that through research of new clean energy technologies, some of which you know is going to buy it, going to benefit ag, a cap and trade system. I just hope your organization will look at some of these issues and help us design a, an effort to, to slow down global warming as well as adopt to it. it just well, thanks for that input. I'll pass that on to my board. We'd love to hear from you. And that's my only comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Great. A uh, gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shadow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Cooley, I want to begin with you. I uh, strongly share your interest in water and in conserving water. Uh, in Arizona, we began a, a very aggressive program towards groundwater storage and uh, restricting the use of groundwater, but also uh, recharging our uh, water table. Um, I guess I'm interested in some innovative ideas from you briefly on that topic, but also uh, I recently built a home. I very seriously considered putting in a gray water system. I didn't put it in, and I now regret that. I'm interested in your thoughts on how widespread that uh, technology is for the use. Can we treat gray, can we, should we be splitting uh, wastewater as it comes out of our houses into a gray water, black water uh, dichotomy? And, and how soon uh, can we do that and have it uh, uh, reduce our reliance on water? And then I have some questions for Dr. Golden. Your first question was on was on groundwater banking and, and what actions we can do to um, encourage and incentivize that. Was, is that correct? Yes. Um, there are a number of things we can do. One, one of the additional benefits, which, which I didn't talk a bit about, was on the issue of stormwater. Um, much of the stormwater runoff is, is really what's polluting our, our rivers and streams. And so capturing that and finding ways and developing in ways in which um, we encourage and, um, you know, basically pursue low impact development to encourage infiltration of that water can also provide a, not only a water supply but a water quality benefit. And so in, in terms of actions that can be done, um, ensuring that all new development does integrate those principles I think is, is, is one of the first things we need to do and also encourage that development doesn't occur on, on some of our most important recharge areas. In the southwest we have huge sudden storms and we lose all that water and right. it's uh, tragic. I don't think we can go on doing that. What about gray water systems? Gray water sy systems, I always get asked about that. Um, it, it's a very interesting topic. Some areas um, in some regions have regulations ag against it, and that's something that we need to kind of standardize and systemize so that there is some consistency, even, even within, a, within a given state. 
Um, I think in new development, it makes a lot of sense. Retrofitting existing developments, it can be expensive, and then there are other things that we could do um, at, at lower cost, such as taking out turf and putting in low water use landscapes and those kinds of things. There's, there's plenty of beautiful landscape that's well adapted to the desert that not only reduces water use, also reduces fertilizers, pesticide, and provides habitat for local species. Yeah, some of us, though, believe that all that green grass reduces the temperature where we live. I happen to live where there's a lot of green grass, and I, I can show you the drop in, my, in the thermometer in my car as I drive into my neighborhood. So I'd rather clean my gray water and water my grass if I could, but I would want to clean my gray water. Uh, Dr. Golden, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you two questions in the limited time I have. Uh, one is I'm interested in your testimony on the point that the average temperature, I believe you testified, in the Phoenix area had come down 3.1 degrees, but in the urban portion uh, of the metropolitan area or of the, or of the county, it had come, it had incre I'm sorry, had gone up 3.1 degrees, but in the urban area it had gone up by 7.6 degrees. Can you explain that and maybe at the same time give us some examples of the practical application of your research and perhaps also uh, of the kinds of materials we might be able to be using in the future uh, that would be uh, more advantageous than materials we've been using in the past without thinking about these issues. Certainly. So, uh, Congressman, if we had a graph and we uh, graphed the tremendous population increase of Maricopa County, Phoenix now being the fourth largest city in the United States and suburb of Mesa larger than most cities in the United States, we would track the same type of the delta T, the temperature difference between the urban and rural area. And while it's true the temperature has gone up 7.6 degrees Fahrenheit, if we look at the temperature difference between an unchanged, and it's very easy to do in Arizona, Casa Grande National Monument, uh, in comparison to where Phoenix temperature recordings have been done, uh, we are now almost 14 degrees Fahrenheit warmer at night uh, than our rural counterparts. And as we see the population increase, we see that temperature difference increase. And that's basically we uh, remove our native vegetation, whether it's cactus or trees or other grass, and we replace that with engineered materials, buildings, concrete, asphalt. Right. And those have a different thermodynamic process. In short, they, they're darker, they absorb the heat, and high school physics, when you cover these buildings, you can't uh, re-radiate long wave radiation, so they don't cool off quickly, and so we have this urban heat island effect. So for cities, there's quite a few things uh, they can look at, and we're looking at. If we were fortunate to fly in the Goodyear blimp, we'd look down at Phoenix and we'd see about 40%, the largest component for most western state cities, is comprised of paved services, driveways, parking lots, et cetera. The idea of incorporating smart water, wastewater issues, pervious concrete, pervious asphalt on uh, paved services that can uh, retain the stormwater and use it for beneficial reuse to sustain trees, which, as we know, is a lot cooler, can help mitigate the urban heat island effect and also offset carbon emissions as well by sequestration a new generation of surface treatments that can reflect uh, while you still can have the same colors. Uh, there's a, a new generation of building materials. In certain climates, green roofs are appropriate. So there's quite a few things that can be done. I would mention that the US EPA Heat Island uh, Reduction Initiative does provide a clearinghouse for a lot of these initiatives. I noticed that uh, you have been a consultant to our mayor, and our mayor and, and our local paper have talked a lot about the fact that we've we cut down all the trees in the city of Phoenix, and there are very few shaded areas. Uh, and if, if you don't have shade and you're outside in the summer in Arizona, you're in hard, uh, you're in, you're in trouble. Uh, we passed legislation at the state legislative level to repaint the tops of all of our buses white. Right. Uh, so you know we're thinking about this stuff a little bit, but we're thinking about it late. It seems to me it's something we have to incorporate into our thinking. Uh, it's pretty clear that the building materials we're using uh, are retaining heat. Uh, and, and some of the I concepts that you mentioned, they're not retaining water. Uh, I think there's a lot of progress we can make here uh, to try to uh, diminish the impact of the urbanization upon kind of the environment in which we live uh, and improve kind of that environment dramatically. So I guess I'm alone and uh, you'll await our return. Uh, I guess I, I am to declare that the select committee is in recess until uh, the votes on the floor are concluded in about 20 minutes. Thank you.
to uh, reconvene for uh, you know 15 or 20 minutes. We uh, we uh, thank you so much for your uh, attendance. Um, let me ask the panel, our, our televisions have been filled with weather-related uh, disasters from the floods in Wisconsin uh, down through uh, Iowa and Missouri, the drought-filled uh, forest fires in California. As a nation, we need to increase our resilience to, to these uh, events, especially as global warming makes them more intense and frequent. Uh, to plan effectively uh, for the future, it is essential that regional scale information is available. Does that information exist today? Uh, Mr. Go Dr. Golden. Uh, uh, Chairman, as I indicated in the uh, oral testimony and what I submitted as written testimony, there is a variety of federal agencies, NGOs, and local and regional governments that do uh, compile regional data that is imperative for more refined understanding of what is occurring and what we'll be able to predict in the future. Um, what I also indicated, though, are two glaring issues. Uh, the first being that there is not a centralized mission agency that can take all of this data and be able to provide to back to other agencies as well as local and regional government the most uh, refined understanding of what is occurring on the regional level. Secondly, as someone who tries to understand what is occurring and what will occur in the future and provide that to local and regional governments, we rely heavily not only on local climate and meteorological stations, but on remote sensing, that being satellite images. And as I indicated, a variety of our satellites are due to expire. We do not have a dedicated urban system, and the refinement by that, the, uh, the detail that is provided in these images is uh, somewhat coarse right now, and the technology provides for much greater refinement. Well, let me ask then, are the members of the panel who would like to respond, uh, what role should the federal government play uh, in supporting and enhancing our understanding uh, uh, by planning for the regional impact of global warming? Give us a recommendation for the federal government's role. Ms. Cooley. Uh, thank you, Chairman. One of the things um, that I'd like to draw attention to is that there's been a substantial amount of cut in the funding for um, some of the mon many of the monitoring programs. For example, for the USGS, uh, many of the stream gauge stations have been shut down, and that data is no longer being maintained. So, increasing funding for for those programs so that we can actually look at trends and see what's happening, um, I think, it is critical. Um, in addition, looking at projections, climate projections, and then downscaling them to local and regional levels so that water utilities can make use of that information and use that in their planning. Um, in California, there is a, a very comprehensive effort to, to do that. Um, at the state level, it's, it's a program done by the California Energy Commission, and they've pulled together a team of researchers um, using the same climate models, the same, um, same uh, emission scenarios and, and are looking at impacts associated with that. So doing those types of activities regionally in other states, I think, I think it's critical. Great. Uh, Mr. Cotter, you uh, sought recognition? Well, one of the reasons that we joined together with uh, other metropolitan cities that are searching for good research with respect to climate change science is exactly um, for the reason that we have many institutions sort of um, foraging out and working on these issues independently, and we feel that the federal government certainly has a role to provide us with unified research on this front. It is extremely important to water managers to have good data on precipitation and precipitation trends. So I echo, you know, the sent, um, the comments made earlier by the members of the panel, but it is extremely important for the federal research to take on this role of looking at the questions that the water managers um, are asking and to have focused research on some of those um, ideas and questions, and particularly with respect to precipitation, which is something that we're all struggling with at this point. And you're dependent upon the federal government. We are dependent upon the federal government as well as on the academic uh, institutions. Well, that goes to you, uh, Dr. Adegoki. Uh, you're an academic representative yeah. here on the panel. Yeah. Um, my, my view on this is, is, 
uh, is that the, the federal government has an, an, an important role, a major role to play, um, but, but that role really is in enhancing capacity at the local level to say climate, climate change and climate variability presents various levels of risks and vulnerabilities to various sectors. You think about agriculture, you think about whatever sector you pick up, you know, or, or even our, our, our city systems. If we look at our cities across, across the country, you know, we are vulnerable at, at various points and, and in, in various ways. And those vulnerabilities can only be, can, can at best assessed at the local level. So what, but, but what we do need, what we do need is, 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 is an, an, an enabling environment in terms of policy that, that provides the, the, the kind of support, both, both, both in, in terms of leadership and in terms of funding. Um, so to, would this to be, are you talking in terms of the National Weather Service um, receiving more funding that then could provide you with the more targeted information that you need on a regional basis in order to make these decisions? Tell us specifically, how much money do you think would be needed and which agencies should get it and what are the responsibilities that we should uh, give them in order to provide the regional information? Well, every agency that has a responsibility for, for some sector of the environment. So the go way, down if we're, ta if we're, talking, about, we're talking about NOAA, for instance, for weather, um, we're, talking about, we're talking about USGS, um, um, for, for we're talking about all, all, our, all our national agencies that have a responsibility for managing our uh, environment need significantly more funding, you know, to enhance which, which observational agency? capacity at the local level. So which agency, Dr. Adagoki, is the lead agency in your mind? Who, who would we put the coordinating responsibilities with to ensure that a package was then sent to a region? How would you construct that federal government responsibility so that it was coordinated there and, you didn't, and it didn't come in from five different locations. Who, which agency should be the lead agency? Uh, doc, uh, Ms. Licata. There is the Climate Change Science Program, and that is currently the federal organization that is supposed to centralize all of the activities of the agencies, and there are multiple amounts of agencies engaged in climate change research and science. So that's the Climate Change Science Program, and I believe they're Where based out of NOAA. I, I believe know. it is out of NOAA, but it, its intended purpose is to coordinate among all of the federal agencies working in this field. So you would make NOAA the lead agency? It seems as though there's already a seed organization within NOAA, so it would make sense to me. And because I do believe that the data and research um, regarding the weather trends, precipitation, the, those rain gauges is really very important, I would suggest that that would be the right way to proceed. And Dr. Golden, do you think NOAA should be the lead agency? I, th I think it depends on exactly what we're talking about. If I look in the, uh, the arena of protecting human health and the environment, that itself is the mission statement of the US EPA. Um, and the US EPA, as do other agencies, and I work with NOAA and CDC and EPA, um, also does a coordinating. So I'm not focusing just on that, but it would seem by their mission statement to protect EPA. human health. put it in the EPA. Yeah. OK. Well, let's have some other uh, votes out here. Uh, Mr. Kepin, where would you put it? Mr. Chairman, thanks. Um, well, you know, going back to your first question, you know, what can Congress do? What can the federal government do? Um, I mentioned in my earlier testimony uh, a bill that was introduced on the Senate side by Senator Bingham and Senator Domenici called the Secure Water Act. It's got some great ideas in there about how to coordinate with all these various entities, kind of bringing them together at one table and so that the lead in that bill. Well, I, I can't recall who I think it might maybe it might be the uh, Interior Department Secretary or it might be the Commerce Secretary. I, I can't quite recall which one, but it does talk about bringing these various entities together that are dealing with climate change. And, um, and then it also... That's Dr. Golden's idea that it should be the EPA. Well, well there's merit there. I mean, I, I have to say I can't argue with what he's saying. Um, I, I think uh, just as long as, as all these parties have a fair say and there's some coordination going on so people know <laughs> what other agencies are doing, I think that would be helpful. And then I would also say that bill, um, the Secure Water Act, contains provisions um, 
that provide funding for additional monitoring and testing and more stream gauges and coordinating between entities in, in, in that way. And also- Noah, do you think NOAA though, NOAA is inside of commerce. Is NOAA really the best agency in your opinion on this, uh, Dr. Mr. Captain? <sighs> well, uh, it sure seems like uh, they have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of expertise that I see they're, um, they're a little bit less maybe. Words, when, when things, when, when, when you have a whole, when we have this hearing in two or three more years and there's been a complete mess and the federal government hasn't passed on the timely um, um, uh, information to the regions by, about something that was anticipatable if it had been put together. Well, who's sitting in Dr. Golden's seat? Who do you want sitting there? Do you want EPA? Do you want NOAA? Who should we be yelling at? <laughs> what do you want to be screaming at? And the other four. So you're saying the agency the that I, I dislike the, the most. <laughs> sitting here going, well, we handed it over. <laughs> this fish and wildlife. Who is who's, who's, who's putting it all together? Well, I, I think what, what I can add to that, you know, is uh, several of the agencies in the last year or two alone, they have all articulated very strong climate change. Right. Um, initiatives, right. whether right. it's, but it's, if it's, it's the U.S. job, it's nobody's but job. But it's, it's so, so who's the in lead charge? agency in the U.S., is the lead who? agency for climate change is has to be NOAA. Has to be NOAA. Okay. It has to be NOAA right. and if, yeah, and in the be, U.S. And Ms. And Ms. Cooley, you got the final vote here. Thank you. Um, well, I think there's, there's a difference, too. Are, are we just talking about monitoring and looking at what is projected under climate change? Or are we then looking at impacts? Because if we're talking about impacts, there's going to be a lot of different agencies that are involved in that. And, and I would agree with um, Ms. Lakata that you know, perhaps the climate research team would, would be a good place for that in terms of bringing all these agencies. Who's in charge of the climate research team right now? Uh, Ms. Cooley? I, I, I'm, I, don't, I, I'm, I do not know. Ah, see, that's not good. See, the <laughs> thing is that we know the name of the Secretary of Commerce. He'd be sitting where Dr. Golden is. We know the head of the EPA. He'd be sitting there. But you need somebody that we can actually say, You've got, you, we gave you the power, right? So, so it's got to be something that has real accountability and people really feel, well, this is important. We have a rising storm here that's going to be hitting communities. So we have to do it in a way that not only has accountability, but that you all know their name, you know? Of course, we, you know, like the equivalent of FEMA, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> that you know the name of the person, you know, in case there's a mess heading your way. That, that's after the fact, though, right? I'm talking about before the fact here now. And FEMA's in, um, uh, now over in Homeland Security. Um, but uh, in a way, this is Homeland Security as well. But we need to raise the accountability because it's reasonably anticipatable that there's going to be some really tragic events that occur. Um, let me, uh, so we'll, we'll, I, I, I see a pretty much uh, 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 a, um, a, a, uh, a split decision here, we're leaning towards NOAA, I would, uh, I would say. Um, uh, Dr. Adagoki, uh, you mentioned uh, taking a bottom-up vulnerability perspective in researching the impacts of climate change. Can you describe what is needed for this research and how the future scientific assessments, such as the one recently released by the United States Climate Change Science Program, should incorporate a bottom-up analysis? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That assessment that you've just referred to, is it, it, it integrates the best of what we know currently, um, but it, 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 it's still a, a translation, a downscaling of the information that we have from general circulation models in terms of future predictions. I'm a, I'm a cl I do climate modeling, I do climate research, I run a climate modeling laboratory. Uh, but I know that when you're looking at regional and local impacts, um, what we have, the projections and the downscaled information that we get from these models do not sufficiently capture okay, the understanding that we need um, to begin to address the question of risk and vulnerability. What we need, okay, is to take a sectoral approach, you know. We have to do a sectoral approach. We have to look at specific sectors, look at water systems, say for instance, in small communities. We look at health across the spectrum. You know, we look at our agricultural systems, you know. What, and, and then do an assessment of risk at each of, 
for each of these sectors. So this, this I think, connects back to your earlier question about who should be a lead agency. We, we, we do need a lead agency, yes, to give direction, okay? But this work has, what I think we really need is a, is a U.S. government that's going to say everything that we do as a government, everybody that we fund as a government needs to look at this question of how are we as a society vulnerable? Where are our risks? Use some of the money that we're giving you. We're going to increase some of your funding to address this issue, but address it at policy-relevant scales. And that policy-relevant scale, I believe, at the, it's, it's would be at, 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 at the local level. Okay, well, let, let me, thank you, uh, Doctor, very much. Let me throw out this question. Um, uh, many of you today have highlighted the amount of water consumed by our fossil fuel and nuclear energy sources. Uh, Mr. Kepin, in your testimony, I was struck by the statistics that by 2030, utilities could account for up to 60 percent of the non-farm water consumed in the entire United States. That is a staggering amount of water just to be consumed by the fossil fuel and nuclear energy uh, industries. Mr. Cooley, you testified that wind and photovoltaic technologies require none to very little water for energy production. Um, this connection between water use and energy production is one that is little understood by the public or even members of Congress. How do the witnesses on our panel today suggest that as Congress considers energy policy, we incorporate this water issue? Uh, Ms. Cooley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, one, way, one way to do that is to, to really integrate water and energy issues and planning so that if we are looking at water supply, we also look at what the energy implications are of, that, of, of those water supply options. Another way would be through, as I had testified, water conservation and efficiency, that that is an important way to not only reduce water use but to reduce energy use, and to doing so is cost effective. So including measures that not only save water but save energy, perhaps setting um, sta federal standards for clothes washers, for example, both consume tremendous amount of water and energy, and, and some of the newer versions that are on the market reduce those use considerably. Um, also, when considering energy technologies to, to look at what the water use are and to consider whether that is an appropriate use of our water resources in the areas that they are being considered. So if, but if 60 percent of the water that is non-farm is in the utility sector, does that not call for a solar and wind revolution in America? Is that basically what we need to have by 2030 in order to prevent this? incredible consumption of uh, water by a very narrow part of the total American economy? Well, it does suggest some opportunities and some additional benefits that wind and solar can provide. So not only reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, but reducing our vulnerability to water supply constraints. In my written testimony, I have provided a, a couple of newspaper head headlines that talk about how water availability affects energy production. And as we look into the future with an increased incidence of drought, as we know, that we are going to have constraints on both energy and water. So uh, I, I think it was your testimony, Dr. Golden, that made a reference to the additional amount of electrical generating capacity we were going to need in the year 2030 in the United States uh, to make up for the increased demand plus the retirement uh, of older plants. Um, could, you, uh, could you tell me again, how, how much new electricity generation in megawatts do you think we need by 2030? About 281,000 megawatts of new power generation capacity will be needed by 2025, which is equivalent okay. to about 950 new power plants, uh, 300 megawatts. So 281,000 new megawatts of electricity by 2025 yes. will be needed in the United States. So if a high percentage of them are nuclear or coal, uh, then we are going to see a uh, huge consumption of water. We will we'll hit that 60 percent target for non-farm 
water consumption in the utility sector. Huh? Is it well, I would add one other factoid to this. And as the USGS in their uh, reports have indicated that it's not agriculture, it's not municipal water, but in fact thermoelectric power is the larger, largest use of water withdrawals, not consumption, water withdrawals in the United States. And that does not go without impacts to our environment and ecological systems as we heat the water, use the water through cooling towers, and then send it back out. Um, so what, what if we adopted a strategy? Let's, let's just say, let's 281,000, where did you get that number from in terms of the needed additional electricity? EIA, DOE. Okay. And, and uh, uh, let's just assume that that's the worst case scenario and that the Department of Energy has, in fact, in increased efficiency in appliances and air conditioning and mm. other devices. And we know for the first six years of the Bush administration they missed all 35 deadlines. But, but so let's assume that no president for the next uh, uh, 18 years meets any deadlines and we have the worst case scenario, which I'm assuming that's what the Department of Energy must be talking about. Um, this year there's an estimation that 7,000 new megawatts of wind will be constructed in the United States. So if you go between now and 2018 and you're very conservative and it's just 7,000 new megawatts of wind per year and you multiply that by 18, that might come out to, <laughs> can you multiply 18 times 7, please? Oh, wait, uh, that would be 126,000 megawatts of the needed 281 under your scenario, huh? Um, which would really put a dent in that big number. Uh, and if we made an assumption that solar, let's just say, was only producing 50,000 megawatts by then, then you might be up to 180,000 or so of the 280,000 megawatts that you need. In other words, a lot of this is avoidable. If you move over to the renewable sources for electrical generation, uh, and uh, could you tell me, does, does gas, Fired electrical plants consume as much water as coal fired. No, no. Is it, do you know what the factor but is there in terms of the uh, equation? No, I, I, not off the top of my head. I can get that. It's back substantially to you. less, though, yeah. is it not? Natural gas as opposed to coal. So, but the new the new natural gas plants are actually dry natural gas plants. Excuse me. Mo many of the new natural gas plants are considered dry natural dry. gas plants. Dry yeah. natural gas. Is there such a thing for coal? Dry coal? No. No. Um, Ms. Cooley, do you, do you know the answer to this question? I, I also do not have those numbers off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to send those to you and, and to your staff members. So if we put in place a program of moving to wind and solar, perhaps geothermal plus natural gas, we could probably drive down dramatically the amount of water by 2025 that is being consumed in the electrical generating sector. Do you agree with that? I would, but I would caution one caveat. When we talk about electrical generation, we need to think about base versus peak. Um, and so our, and as an advocate of renewable energy, uh, I concur with your statements. My only caution is that we need to ensure that this is a, a base load and we can also meet our peak. Well, a lot of people are saying that because of the high price now for oil, that it's driving up the price of natural gas. And as a result, we're discovering a lot more natural gas in the United States. So if we use the natural gas as the base load mm -hmm. and then we built our wind and solar around it as a plan so that it still had the base load capacity being natural gas and whatever, you know, is the remainder of, of coal, is that a strategy for reducing water consumption while still maintaining the base load capacity? Yes. Okay. Um, so. So, uh, so we need a plan for America going forward towards 2025 because what you've laid out here is pretty catastrophic in terms of the amount of water being consumed and what the impact then is on all the other needs that we have in, uh, in our society. So, um, so at this point, my time um, has uh, been consumed and the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, <laughs> has arrived and I will recognize him to ask. quite frustrated that I've had two other committee meetings that have kept me from this, but I've had a chance to review this testimony and it's just really outstanding. 
Yeah, you've saved the best hearing for last, <laughs> like the wedding feast at Cana. You know, <laughs> we, we appreciate that. Now this is this is terrific stuff, um, and I'm I'm particularly interested in this because our time um, time doesn't prevent we're being called to another hearing, I mean another uh, vote. But um, I'm hopeful that uh, there'd be a chance for us to explore with you in greater depth uh, what uh, the federal government can do in terms of promoting uh, reasonable land use uh, as a way to uh, help reduce um, the impacts from flooding. And the federal government, uh, uh, part of something that's frustrated me for years is how hard it worked to get the most minimal reforms in the flood insurance program uh, where we kept putting people back in harm's way. Uh, I, w I would particularly uh, appreciate if you would have a chance to review the uh, legislation that's currently uh, wending its way through uh, dealing uh, with flood insurance uh, for uh, ways that we might be able to tweak that to help the, for the federal government to do a better job to reduce that. Um, and I, I think I have time, though, maybe to get an answer, uh, Mr. Keppen, just uh, dealing uh, with issues that relate uh, uh, to the promotion of uh, farm policies on the part of the federal government. We lost an opportunity. Uh, Policies that relate to um, uh, the promotion, the things going forward, we can do with uh, with a federal agricultural policy to try and take advantage of uh, preserving key lands, using it uh, to uh, preserve and protect communities, and be able to strengthen agriculture. Even though we missed the boat with the farm bill, literally and figuratively, I wonder if you had other thoughts and observations about what we could and should be doing at this point. Um, well, one of the, I guess you brought up an, a, a, uh, an observation earlier about land use um, and, and how the, the government can, can work on that. And it sounds like your comments were targeted towards flood insurance. You know, in the West, our watershed areas are almost all owned by the federal government and they're in bad shape. Uh, I don't know if you've been to northern Colorado or southern Wyoming lately, but those watersheds are, are dying. They're, they're, the trees are dying. Even around where I live, Klamath Falls, uh, we've got lots of areas where beetle kills, taking out trees. We've got to get back and get serious about watershed management. And that has uh, uh, benefits not just for uh, timber and wildlife and economies, but also flood control, because most of your areas uh, draining downstream uh, start in, in federal lands in the west. Right. Um, uh, you know, all I can say as far as looking for ways to protect farmland and that sort of thing, my organization, you know, and we're even catching some heat for it, uh, trying to get out and develop partnerships with, uh, with conservation groups. We worked with conservation groups on the farm bill to try to come up with some programs that would uh, help water supplies in rural areas. Um, uh, it's getting to a point right now where uh, that's going to be the way of, of doing business just for farmers to survive. I, I talked to the president of my board, Wyoming Rancher, uh, yesterday. He spent, he's spending uh, $2,000 per vehicle per week on gasoline alone, just getting around on his ranch. And he said he's going to go broke. He, he, can't, he can't make it. So it, the, the eco economics are forcing agriculture, I think, to start to be a little bit more innovative and maybe creating partnerships with groups that we've uh, been adversaries with in the past. So those are some of the things that we're working on. Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, leave uh, as, a, as an open-ended request uh, for suggestions about specific policies. It seems to me that uh, we have a new transportation bill that's coming forward. Uh, we are going to be looking at uh, energy. Uh, the cap and trade is going to be uh, likely, no matter who is president, and being able to use a small portion of this uh, resource to be able to help people um, to be able to cope with um, the disasters, particularly as it relates to, to water. Uh, policies uh, on federal land itself um, that should be adjusted, um, flood insurance, sort of the, the sense of, of priority that you have for things that we're going to have walking through uh, uh, the capital 
uh, over the course of the next 30 months um, for specifics would be of great interest to me. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. the gentleman. We just have time to give five minutes to the gentleman from New York, and then we will have to uh, adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. Uh, I will ask uh, primarily my questions to Ms. Licata, since you, she's, uh, we're fortunate enough to have her here today. In the Northeast, we have the country's oldest wastewater infrastructure, which means roofs. Um, and they're not really picturesque. It's really a tank on a roof. But what it does is it has the effect of detaining stormwater. Thank you very much. And I compliment you on your work and the mayor for his leadership in this uh, regard. Um, how can Congress help local communities uh, best address this particular threat? One of the very um, significant challenges that New York has is really the age of its infrastructure system. And what we need um, sorely is to build out the remainder, remainder of infrastructure. So we have these two problems. One, we have not kept pace with development pressures in the outer boroughs. Um, so we have a lot of infrastructure that still has yet to be built. Um, and two, we really need to resize and rethink infrastructure that was built, say, in the early 1920s um, and before we saw major growth um, after World War II. So those are two major um, sources of funding that the city is, is lacking. Thank you. And you have, uh, the city has uh, a number of reservoirs and, of course, the aqueduct, aqueduct system, uh, which runs through my district. and. Uh, several reservoirs in my district and other upstate uh, districts. Uh, in the 19th district of New York, we've had three 50-year floods in the last five years. Uh, some of the, the uh, uh, extreme weather events that the doctor and uh, the rest of the panel have been talking about. Um, and I'm curious, in terms of the Delaware watershed, uh, which has experienced, in particular, uh, April 29th of last year, the, the nor'easter that uh, uh, flooded uh, Port Jervis and other communities in uh, Orange County, uh, and also my hometown of Dover Plains in Dutchess County, where the 10 mile was flooding again for the third 50 year time in five year period. Um, there's been talk about whether the New York City reservoir system could be used if we knew in advance that an extreme rain event was about to happen, um, and whether the, there's a possibility of letting some water out in advance so that then it can be, some of the rain can be uh, retained. I, I understand it's a complicated question. It requires maybe better science than we have. But do you have any thoughts about those? It is a very complicated question to answer in a short amount of time. But what I will say is that the department has implemented a flexible flow management program. And what that allows us to do is to maintain a certain void within those reservoirs on the Delaware system. However, the void can only be maintained when we have a certain or a more certain probability of refill. So once we get past June 1st, it's very difficult for us to maintain um, a void because we won't have um, the, well, at least by hind casting, we won't have precipitation events that we can be certain of. So one of the other strategies that we can use is to look to make our croton system more robust. We're bringing a filtration plant online there. And to be able to develop aqueducts that will allow further interconnectivity between the Delaware system and the Catskill system. And these are all strategies that the department is um, analyzing, but these are very long-term strategies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. We have. Uh we have uh, time for each of you to give us your concluding 20 seconds. That's all you have. What do you, what do you want us to remember for the final 20 seconds? Ms. Cooley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you again for inviting me here today to speak. Um, I think the, the things I would like, would like you to remember today is that we, we are faced with challenges, both from climate change as they're related to floods and droughts and from population, continued population growth. The good news is that we have a number of, of options available that are not only effective today, but are effective in the future. And so I would encourage um, the government and the legislature to, to go ahead and move forward and pursue these options, including, and I'll, and I'll restate, smart floodplain management, developing alternative supplies, and conservation 20 seconds efficiency. On the head. Thank you. D Mr. Kepin. <laughs> well, I would say in a nutshell, um, we're looking at uh, uh, competition for water in the West, limited supplies, and right now agriculture is the default reservoir to meet a lot of these new demands. And we need to be thinking about our ability as a country to be self-sufficient 
and somehow that needs to find its way into the highest levels as a national policy. 20 seconds. Thank you, um, Ms. Kevin. Ms. Dr. Thank you. Golden. Uh, finally, our communities are at risk. Uh, we have a variety of federal agencies that are doing great work, but we need leadership to bring that great work to bear back to the local and regional governments. Thank you. Did that in nine seconds. Ms. Sakata. Uh, we need to update flood plain maps within the city of New York. And two, I believe we need federal partnerships to go ahead and about the business of downscaling those global, um, I should say, general circulation models into more regionally specific models. Floodplain maps in New York, like a movie, huh? Uh, that's going to happen. Preview of coming attractions. Uh, uh, Dr. Adagoki. We need to strengthen the research cap capacity that we have in this country to begin to address the questions of risk and vulnerability that we are facing um, as a society. Thank you, Dr. Adagoki, very much. We have a roll call on the floor that will begin in a minute and 22 seconds. Uh, Mr. Hall and I would like to take a picture with you, and then uh, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.